Hey guys, I'm back. I think I'm actually going to change the name of my YouTube channel to the Focusing Channel. This is a yet another video related to telescope focusing. This time, I want to kind of share some results with you of how I use the Batonoff mask uh, along with my Pegasus Astro uh, Focus Cube 2 to measure the backlash and filter offsets. And I'm pretty happy with the results, and I thought the technique worked pretty good, so I thought I'd just share it with you here quickly. This all started a couple of weeks ago, I suppose. I was out uh, doing some imaging, and I used the hyperbolic curve fit Excel spreadsheet that I posted up on the on the site and also have a video on. I went and collected some data when I was focusing on this particular target uh, at the with the focuser moved out and then uh, moved the focuser in and then using the uh, astrophotography tool half flux diameter or focusing aid to measure the half flux diameter of, the, of a given star. I did this little process here where I start and record the half flux diameter at different focuser positions continuing to move in. Did a curve fit and found out that, okay, what I need to do now is move back out to the ideal focus position of 4684. The problem is this is where I ended up. Now I know now that this is due to the backlash not having been fully compensated so i did not and was not able to make it actually back to the ideal focus location and when i first got the image after setting the focus there i realized that it was clearly out of focus not to the point of a donut shape but clearly not a a pinpoint star as i was expecting and i wondered uh, of course, in addition to the backlash issue, if maybe just relying on a single star to collect the half-flux diameter output and then fitting a curve to a single star half-flux diameter data, if, if there's just too much error in there. Nina and Sequence Generator Pro use kind of an image-wide average of the half-flux diameter or full width and half-maximum uh, metrics. And as a result, it probably gives you, probably reduces some of that error. So I was afraid this might be the issue. And so I went back to the images that I had for the different focuser positions and collected, looked at a, picked a different star out and once again used the focus uh, aid tool in astrophotography tool to record the half flux diameter of three other stars in addition to the one that I had just showed you. And basically these data here, uh, this cluster of data here represent what I got from using four stars in, in those images. And then I just, for a given focus or position, I could simply average the numbers and get a single value for the half flux diameter for that focus or position and then fit a curve to that. And that's what this blue curve is. And of course, it turns out, it's good news, it came out at about the same focus, ideal focus position as I had with the single uh, star. Then I took those same images and fed them into the PixInsight subframe selector. And uh, obviously it's measuring the full width at half maximum as opposed to the half flux diameter. So it's different values uh, from, from those two different metrics. But once again, the, the data are consistent and you fit a curve to that, fit the hyperbolic curve to that. And once again, the uh, ideal focus position is the same as, as it is for the four star estimate or even the one star estimate, which is actually very good news because it does confirm that you can use just a single star and the half flux diameter data to identify the ideal, the optimum focus point. Now, the bad news is that this confirmed that I was uh, badly underestimating the uh, backlash error in the focuser and uh, I really needed to set aside some time and do a decent job of measuring that backlash. And so that's what I wanted to share with you here. And in essence, what I've done is to go through for a range of focuser positions with the Batonoff mask on and cycle through all of the filters for a given focuser position and record the Batonoff error mat mask focus error. And I'll show you what that is in just a second. And did that moved the focuser in, did, repeated the process, moved the focuser in, repeated the process, and I'll show you with you the data uh, from that little study. But here's what that looked like as I recorded the screen during that process. So here I am setting up the spreadsheet that I was going to enter in the data uh, as it came across. I set up a little imaging plan that allowed me to cycle through all of the filters and uh, simply uh, 
have short exposures, two seconds for the luminance, five for the color filters, 15 for the narrow band. And then as I was focused on Mirfac, I just renamed the data to focus uh, so that I could find it more easily uh, later on and set the process going at a focuser position of, in this case, 5300. And then as the data came in, you can see that the focus error as measured up here in, in this uh, in this uh, region right here is minus 8.67 pixels. And so I would just type that in going uh, as, the, uh, as the imaging plan progressed through. And it goes pretty quickly early on because it's a uh, two seconds exposure for luminance, five seconds for the color filters. And it's just a matter of typing in the numbers. Now I'm using the Batonoff grabber itself here because so, that allows me to define a bigger area surrounding the star, which I have found is necessary when I switch over to the uh, narrow band filters and there's a lot less light. So if I find that the uh, astrophotography tools Batonoff A doesn't always properly identify the diffraction spikes, but you're more likely to, to get a good identification with the Batonoff grabber tool. So as you can see, there's far less light here with the hydrogen alpha filter in place. And that's a 15 second exposure. You could increase the exposure time, but of course that just takes longer to go through this process. And uh, it's quite easy to uh, have it sit and monitor a given area of the screen as, it, as each image comes in, it just gives you a new, uh, immediately recalculates what the focus error is. And then you can, I could simply type that in. Now, once I get finished with this sulfur two filter and type in the results, now I can go back to astrophotography tool and adjust the focus position to moving it inward. So I had moved the focuser out far enough to know that I wasn't going to, uh, I was well beyond what the backlash was. And now I'm moving it in at 20 steps and I'll just change that. Now this is less than the backlash. So we should see essentially the same data we got in that first application of this imaging plan we should get basically the same thing because we were suffering through we had to fight through all of the uh, backlash before we start actually moving the focusing tube well as you can imagine this takes a bit of time especially moving at only 20 steps per increment but i wanted to get some good data and also try to characterize how much noise is in the data but as you can see, I'm also getting essentially the same results for this filter position, focuser position, as I was for the previous focuser position because we're, we're still within the backlash zone. All right, so let's go back and take a look at the results we got from the study. Uh, we started at 5300 in that uh, video. You saw that. Then we moved the focuser in 20 positions and got basically the same Batonoff focus error uh, that we had at uh, at position 5300. Again, repeated that, roughly the same. Anyway, we have a fairly flat line here because of backlash. And then finally, we start to use up, take up all the, the uh, gaps in between the gears. And then we proceed on in a fairly, uh, in a very linear fashion until we end the, uh, the study back here. But what you can see is once the backlash has been taken out, these lines and the focus error, the Batonoff focus error, tends to decrease linearly. And I think this Batonoff focus error is actually a pretty good metric because it is a signed uh, value. In other words, there's a positive and a negative, so ideal focus is when it's equal to zero. Do this, of course, with a half flux diameter or the full width at half maximum, but there you're trying to identify the minimum as opposed to a zero crossing. So this has a very clear location of where perfect focus is. As I mentioned in the discussing the video, you want to do this when the temperature is a constant just to keep those effects out of the mix here. Uh, I am very uh, pleased with the consistency of the results. You'll notice that the uh, red-ish filters, the red, the hydrogen alpha, and the sulfur two, all behaved similarly. And of course, on the blue end of the spectrum, we have the, the blue filter and the oxygen three filter all behaving uh, as one. And then the green and the luminance filter in between here uh, in between the two. So you get a nice uh, separation as a function of wavelength essentially for each of these these filters where they cross the axis. Now once the backlash is removed, another thing that's kind of nice about this, and I didn't realize until I did this study, is that the focus error behaves linearly, is changes linearly with the focuser position. And that's 
uh, very handy if as a uh, predictive tool. In other words, you can take two measurements at two, get the Batonoff error at two different focuser positions, and then use that to dial in exactly where the that line crosses the zero error axis, and then that is your ideal focus. The filter offsets are these that we'll put enter into astrophotography to is the gap or the distance in focuser position, for instance, for the blue filter and where it crosses the line and where the luminance filter crosses the line. And similarly, where the hydrogen alpha filter, for example, crosses the line relative to the luminance filter. So these curves here give us the filter offsets that we're looking for. And if we zoom in on the curve, you can see roughly where the data uh, that I collected fall through here. And then I used Excel. This is the Excel spreadsheet I was filling out in that uh, video. And I used the intercept function to identify the data in the, in the linear range, which is basically from about uh, 5160, position 5160 down. This is when the data was essentially linear use that to calculate the intercept and the slope for each one of the filters and then the zero crossing occurs when you take this intercept divided by the slope take the absolute value and then that becomes the the focus or position where that best fit line uh, crosses the axis and I did that for uh, the luminance filter and then I did it for each of the color filters but uh, essentially subtracted the luminance filter crossing from the color filter uh, focus for position crossing zero crossing and then so these numbers that you see here are the filter offsets that uh, we can enter into astrophotography tool and once again they're very consistent the uh, red filter says that it has a filter offset of plus 30 and likewise the hydrogen alpha and sulfur 2 have plus nearly 30 plus 27 and of course there's some error here in a focus or position variance of plus or minus one position is nothing uh, on the grand in the grand scheme of things here so for all intents and purposes you can enter in 30 for each of these uh, the red the hydrogen alpha and the sulfur 2 data likewise the blue uh, data are also consistent minus 29 so it's 29 steps in and then the oxygen is minus 31 so minus 30 works well for those uh, two filters and then of course the green is a is different from either the red or the blue and so it's just a, a minus 13 uh, offset for it so th these are the numbers we're looking for for the filter offsets and it's pretty uh pretty consistent also i recorded as i went through this the temperature and i mentioned you want to do this when the temperature is essentially constant and you can see here it's i think it's just some minor fluctuations in the uh, sensor readout rather than actual temperature variation but certainly we're at fractions of a degree which is is kind of what you what you want when you're doing something like this now let's take a look at the focuser backlash study i did this is something a little bit different we've already seen uh, the the effect of backlash is that horizontal line uh, that eventually goes into a diagonal line but what i did here was to start at, um, for example, an outward focuser position and then step through, using the luminance filter only this time, step through different focuser positions recording the Batonoff focus error until I cross the uh, zero axis. And then I, going in the same direction, in this case inward, I would jump it out to another location or farther out location, again, just to make sure I was away from the, from the backlash. And this time I moved the focuser inward, or outward rather, until it crossed the axis, and then give it another push to punch it out uh, farther, and then come back in along the axis to get to, uh, to until I cross the, uh, the zero or the ideal focus axis, and again, repeated it. So I have a couple of passes through uh, ideal focus, moving the focuser in and moving it out. And uh, the focus for backlash then is just the difference between where the inward travel ideal focus occurred and where the outward travel ideal focus occurred. And in this case, it comes out to about 90 steps, uh, 92 for, <laughs> to be uh, totally accurate. But again, a couple of steps, not that meaningful. So 90 steps is about the kind of focus or backlash I'm seeing in my system. And that makes a lot of sense with some of the things that I've observed 
uh, in, in using this focuser. Again, I think these results are very consistent, which is good. These, the zero crossing for the inward moving travel occurred at the same location, and the uh, outward travel uh, zero crossing occurred at the same level, which is, is good news um, for, the, for this study. Some people say that it's, it's okay to overestimate the backlash. Uh, I, I don't understand that. Uh, to me, you want to get it right. Uh, because if you are moving to a specific location, any error in the backlash will either, either miss it low side or miss it to the high side, depending if you underestimate or overestimate the amount of backlash. Now, the backlash is it's not this single number. There is a bit of a, a gray area in there, but I don't think you want to be overestimating the, uh, your backlash any more than you want to underestimate it. I think you want to do your level best to provide the best estimate of the backlash. And so let's jump over to APT and enter the numbers that we got from this study. We'll go over to the APT settings and into the uh, filter wheel location to enter in the offsets. Now you'll notice, recall that we had uh, essentially a positive 30 for the reddish filters. So I can enter those in. And we had a minus 30 for the bluish filters. And I had a minus 13 for the green filter. And so we should be set here. This should be all we need to do to uh, make little adjustments. And these are relatively little adjustments to the focus or position when we change filters. And, and uh, as long as we've taken care of backlash, which we'll do the setting for that uh, here momentarily, then we should be good to go. I can go into the focuser position and type in the backlash here. And in my case, I would type in 90 here and 90 here. Now, when I've done that, um, it works just fine, of course. It, there's also this little box here that you can check that would tell it to uh, hide the backlash moves from you uh, so you don't see them in the focuser position. But when I tried this out, uh, and without this checked, I don't believe I saw the uh, the backlash steps being accounted for, which is what I would want. I, I want this to be a seamless thing that's taken care of behind the scenes. So I don't know if this tick mark here goes with the emulation of the focus position here. I'm not sure what that is. But anyway, I didn't see the effect, and I would probably be happy just typing those numbers in right there and being done with it. Now, there's another way to do this another place to enter these numbers. And that's by going back over to the gear tab, go to the focuser, go into the ASCOM settings, and here you can type in the backlash number 90 that we got and turn on the backlash compensation, compensation here. So there you have it. That's all we have to enter in into astrophotography tool to account for the filter offsets and the backlash. Well, what I've certainly found, and I think everybody who has an automatic, uh, has an electronic focuser knows this, it's uh, critical to accurately measure the focuser backlash. It's a large enough number that if you're not accounting for it, you will be out of focus uh, on, on, as you change from one filter to the next. Uh, it's somewhat less critical to measure the filter offsets for parafocal filter sets. In my case, the, the offset numbers are fairly small, and you could just go with, with a, a setting of zero. You'd probably be okay. But the big, the big uh, factor here is getting the backlash down. I'd like this Batonoff mask approach uh, seemed to work out pretty well as long as your uh, there's temperature changes that are not happening at the same time. I, I like the Batonoff mask error filter uh, focus error. I think it's uh, it's handy to have a signed uh, error where it's easy to identify what perfect focus is. And of course, you could do the same thing with the half flux diameter and full width at half maximum. You just have to just identify where the the slope is zero as opposed to a zero crossing because those numbers are always positive. Um, again, do the study like this if you're going to do this when the temperature is constant. It's tempting to want to do this at, at dusk um, when, the, when the sun is just setting and before you actually start imaging because you'll be able to see a bright star and can do the study, but that's when the temperatures are, are changing most rapidly. So I think you want to stay away from, from that. Uh, the 
Another thing that I found out in this process I, I did not realize uh, is that the Batnoff focus error varies linearly with focus position once you've taken care of the backlash. So it actually should be very easy to find ideal focus with the Batnoff, using the Batnoff focus error, get the, button, the focus error at two different focus positions and you can interpolate or extrapolate out to the zero error line and be fairly certain that you're going to be in critical focus and ideal critical focus. And then on a side note, I went off and, and looked at uh, the effect of using a single star and the half flux diameter in that kind of that manual procedure that I, I've talked about in an earlier video where you get half flux diameter data, fit a hyperbolic curve to it, identify ideal focus. It turns out that that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it's, it's as good as using multiple stars and it's as good as using a full field average full width at half maximum or half flux diameter assessment. Well, I hope this little procedure using the Batnoff mask and the Batnoff focus error to define focuser backlash and filter offsets is useful to you. All right, guys, have a good holiday. Talk to you later.